Hello, and thank you for joining us in Mapping the Zone, a podcast dedicated to a highly fixated review of large, dense books, usually the works and context of Thomas Pinchon. My name is Cody. I'm one of the co-hosts. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm Luke. And I'm Will. This is uh, our first go-round of, of bonus episodes between Bleeding Edge and Against the Day. So uh, we're going to each kind of bring our own thing as we have in the past and talk about something non pinch on that we, that we enjoy and try to uh, sell the others on. And uh, hopefully those of you listening, if you're not familiar with it already, uh, can find something new to experience and enjoy. I wasn't aware these were sales pitches. I feel like I've it's... needed to like <laughs> kick up yeah. my charisma a bit. Yeah, um, we're all working on behalf of the, the artist that we're talking oh, about and trying to okay. increase their sales. Yeah, Good to know. Where is our royalty check? Oh, uh, yeah, that one. I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll write another letter to Otessa Moshfeg and be like, hey, you actually owe me <laughs> some money. Yeah. So in the past, I, I've, done, uh, I've done a movie. I've done a video game. So I thought I would actually get around to doing a book this time. But... Um, I thought I'd also keep it in the music genre. Uh, so I, I, this is a, a non-fiction work uh, chronicling the life um, of, of one of my favorite musicians. Uh, it is called Leanne Rimes, Teen Country Queen. And no, I'm not doing that. I did actually, my <laughs> wife had a copy of that book. And I thought I should do this. That would be hilarious. I'm not going to, I can't. It was, it was published in 97, so it doesn't even cover... A majority <laughs> of her career, arguably, just, probably the most famous portion of her it, career. Fair, fair enough. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm really sad now. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll do it next time. Excited. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, I'm actually now, Cody. You have to I read know. that and then report back. It's only a hundred and something pages. I can do it. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm actually doing a a book I posted about a little while ago called "The Red Handler" by Johann oh. Harstad. Um, I've been, anyone who listens to the show knows I, I love, uh, detective fiction. Um, I think we all enjoy that on, on some level, at least pinch on certainly yeah. does. Kate doesn't, um, it's terrible. So, and I've, I've been, especially after going through bleeding edge, I, I was finding myself reading a lot more, uh, detective fiction throughout the year. I recently finished, uh, I reread devil in a blue dress, which I hadn't read since probably high school. Um, really enjoyed that one that was a really good read um and just here and there throughout the, the year i've been reading you know a little bit more uh detective fiction revisiting some of the ones that i really enjoyed this one i found when we went uh, my family and i took a road trip up to kansas city over the summer and we stopped at a bunch of different bookstores um i found this one just in in a a bookshop slash bar up in dallas um called um I think it was in Terabang. Might be wrong on that, but I think that it's was where. the Wild Detectives, I think. Wild Detectives, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and is it the, was... Wait, 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 is this a noir-themed bar? It kind of is, yeah. That's neat. It's really cool. It's like a really small little, uh, like, almost like a converted house that they turned into a bar on one side. On the other side, there's like a, a wall of books, essentially, and mm -hmm. um, kind of a an assortment of, of books in there, but a lot of them were, um, you know, crime fiction, detective fiction, stuff like that. Um, and this one just kind of jumped out at me. I had never heard of it, but I was just kind of looking at the back of it. And, um, it's essentially a, an homage to, but also a, uh, kind of deconstruction of detective fiction. So it's, it's playing with the format a lot in, in, in a very reverent way, but also willing to uh, really examine the, the, the flaws and the, um, the tropes of the genre, which, you know, I think most people who enjoy detective fiction are already aware of its, you know, inherent tropes and its, um, the, the, the way that the stories are structured. There's usually not a lot of, of, deviation from that in most of them especially in the older ones you know your hammets and your uh canes and and chandlers tended to follow somewhat of a of a formula and a structure but it you know they were compelling reads and they're fun and i i think that 
it's a genre that I will probably never tire of. I've read bad ones for sure. I've read, you know, some authors mm-hmm. that have tried their hand at it and it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but even I, the Isaac ones Asimov's terrible at writing <laughs> defective, detective fiction, but he kept going back to that well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, I find myself often going back and, and rereading, um, some of the ones that I, I really enjoy. And, um, I got my son, he's reading Maltese Falcon right now. So that's kind of his intro into it. And we're going to watch the movie when he finishes it. Oh, neat. Yeah. And it, and so it's, you know, I, I was immediately fascinated by it and I started flipping through it. And basically the, the way this book is structured is the, the author, Johan Harstead, presents this as he found this series of, of micro novels uh, by Frode Brandegen, uh, who is Norwegian, which uh, Johan Harstad is as well. Um, and the, the, con- the concept here is that Brandegen had submitted these micro novels to his publisher after his debut novel, which was an experimental 2000 plus page novel called Conglomerate Breath. Um, that never got reviewed and just kind of flew off the radar. So he he started doing these sort of micro novels, sort of like flash fiction, I guess, uh, but even shorter, really. Most of these uh, chapters are a couple of sentences. In some cases, some of them hit a page. But they're all centered around this detective called the Red Handler. And within all of the the micro novels themselves are notes. So you're kind of jumping back and forth, um, you know, seeing what the editor has to say about these certain parts of the book. And it's, it's wildly funny. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it is a, a very clear homage to the detective novel. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of poking a lot of fun at how, uh, similar a lot of them are and, and you know like I said a lot of the tropes remain the same so I have, I have a few selections that I wanted to kind of share with y'all uh, the first is in the uh, the story The Red Handler Hot on the Trail uh, this is in chapter 2 suddenly he heard a sound he could see nothing he opened his eyes that helped and the note to that says uh, the three sentences dealing with the eyes are easy to dismiss as bland, even silly. But looking past their slapstick absurdity enables us to notice Brandegan's critique of crime literature in which novels often get needlessly prolonged, often by several hundred pages, and the reader's time wasted by the detective's failure to look closely and follow up on clues and hunches fast enough. To Brandegan, the overwhelming majority of crime fighting heroes were shockingly ineffective in the sense that the, they coldly allowed the suspense to idle and the reader is led on like the dog who follows a biscuit held by its owner as the latter moves further and further away, and were therefore unworthy of the fame they were customarily afforded. To his mind, the profusion of dead ends and suspects quickly became tedious. In these three sentences, on the other hand, the red handler A identifies his problem and chief constraint, his eyes are closed, B takes action and solves the difficulty, he opens his eyes, and C is once again able to do his job in a prompt and exemplary manner. So it's these little just kind of goofy... Uh, moments that are that are peppered into these stories, but the stories themselves are also they really work in in the in this sort of you know old you know thirties and forties detective uh, novel style. So it's there is a cohesive story throughout each of these, even though they're only five or six chapters that are made up of a few paragraphs at a time. And then with within all of that, it it acts as a series itself. So it's it's pretty clever that he has been able to maintain the cohesive story that flows through it, but also working as an editor and showing the the various notes that he's leaving along the way that kind of explain, you know, why this works and why this doesn't work. Another selection comes from one of the other uh, micro novels in here called uh, The Red Handler Stumbles Across It, uh, where he uh, encounters a, a criminal and gets into a fight. And it just says, Handler's right hook and merciless jabs. The killer didn't stand a chance. The note to which reads, Brandegan knew nothing about boxing. Nothing. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's things like that where I, I had initially kind of gone into this thing thinking like, okay, this, this is going to be, you know, some kind of really high concept take on, on the detective novel. I wasn't expecting the, the level of humor um, that existed in here. And, and the moment that really got me is in the micro novel The Red Handler and the Great Diamond Heist. And this is a moment where I uh, was, I remember I was sitting on the couch and I was laughing out loud and I had to let my wife read this. This is chapter two of this story. The Red Handler opened the drapes and looked out over the street. It was deserted this early in the morning. 
He shuffled into the kitchen, started the coffee, and took out the sandwich iron. He was a man who knew the value of a good breakfast. While spreading orange marmalade on the toast, he thought of the words he'd heard from the mysterious voice, keep your eyes open. The red handler arranged his breakfast on a tray he'd gotten himself as a Christmas present and settled in beside the window. Right after his first <laughs> sip of coffee, he saw a person running down the street. The red handler stood up and yelled out to him, hey, you there, stop. The person stopped and glanced nervously at the detective leaning out of the window in his bathrobe. Are you the thief? shouted the red handler. Nope, the person answered. Sorry. The red handler had no choice but to let him go. A setback, no question. This would be a much harder case to crack than he'd thought. The detail that he bought himself a yeah. Christmas present. Oh, and there's a there's a bunch of notes about that Christmas present. <laughs> it's completely unnecessary, but also like very, very telling of his character. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it 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 goes on like that. Like there are there's a bunch of more sections that I highlighted, but I don't want to give away too much uh of of the uh the story in here. Uh, the con the not conclusion of that, but the next scene of that. Um, back by the window, the red handler saw another person running down the street. Stop! The birds flapped up from the rooftops when they heard the red handler's voice ringing out. The person stopped abruptly. Are you the diamond thief? The red handler asked gravely. The thief let go of his sack and loot and put his hands up. I can't deny it, no. Just as I thought. You'd better bring that loot over here, because you're under arrest. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's, uh, you know, he, the, the editor makes these notes throughout here, you know, about how, like, ridiculously easy it is, but it's supposed to be easy because the, de the detective's a detective and, and that's what they do. But there's also these, like, long-winded notes about the, the creation of and history of uh, parkour versus free running and what distinct uh, traits mark each of those two things and why it's important to know that they're different. Uh -huh. There are just these hilarious moments where you know the the christmas present thing comes back a few times like i said because this is a, a presented as a series of of novels of micro novels there is a general storyline that runs through it and it's actually a really cool story that kind of carries itself through and, and keeps it from just being a you know a sort of slapstick let's make fun of detective stories kind of thing there was another couple of sections that i wanted to read to y'all real quick hold on just a second so this is in one of the the, the later stories uh the red handler sucked a mint pastille slowly and pointed at the mysterious figure whose back was still turned and who bent over the corpse with a smoking gun in one hand are you the one who did this what are you talking about the mysterious figure protested are you the killer the mysterious figure turned toward the red handler and threw out his arms in resignation damn you caught me hook line and sinker but tell me how did you get wise to me the note of this, to this reads the murderer caves under the onslaught of the red handler's questioning we are quickly whisked into the explanation phase of the novel <laughs> your fatal your fatal mistake was when you decided to look mysterious well i'll be <laughs> but there's no sense denying it you're good too good i guess i guess i'm in for a long jail sentence now <laughs> <laughs> it's it's things like that and the I, the funniest part of all of this to me and this is kind of where I wrap it up. This is a, it's a pretty short book. It's like with the notes and everything, it's a little over 250 pages. <laughs> it goes on this very long kind of thing about a Yugoslavian filmmaker who was making offshoots of Clint Eastwood films using an actor named Cliff Eastwood. And they were all filmed in Esperanto. And the, <laughs> the titles of some of these films, because he couldn't use obviously the, the original titles for the movie. So there was uh, some of them were like, Green forests, blue pants, whole people and children. Uh, I'll kiss you, but then I've got to go to work. Osteoporosis isn't for the faint of heart. The British erotic thriller comedy, My Jeans and Your Jeans. It's hilarious. It's a really cool book. If you can find it, it's, it's really worth the read. I think I, I read this over a few days, and I went back and then reread it uh, to do this. And it was an absolute blast. The, the author, Johan Harstead, has a bunch of other... Uh, books that I want to find now, um, including one I think that was, as I remember it, it was it was about Buzz Aldrin, and the person, the main character of the story was following him around or trying to find him because he felt like he was also the second best person since Buzz Aldrin was second on the moon. I think it takes place in the Faroe Islands too. Anyway, it's this <laughs> this was a really really fun read, and if you can find a copy of it, I, I highly recommend it. It really. You can tell that he really loves detective fiction and, and wanted to make a compelling story 
uh, in that genre, but at the same time, really step back and look at the genre and, and have fun with it and kind of take it apart to see what really makes it work and, and not work. Um, so yeah, all in all, it's, it's just a fun read. It had me laughing a lot and, and I really, uh, really enjoyed it. I'll probably go back to it a few more times. What, uh, what drew you to this book in particular when you were going through the books in the bar? Cause I would imagine there was probably a lot of different options. There were, and I, I got a, several more books from that bookstore oh, as well. Did you? But, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. I bought, I bought a ton of books on that road trip. No, I was reading the back. Um, so part of it was the, the fact that the author's Norwegian. I've, I've been learning Norwegian over the last 200 something days. And Duolingo. so, yeah, my son challenged us all to do Norwegian for some reason was the one he picked. And I'm the only one really that's been sticking with it, but it was just reading the back. Like I, I saw the cover at the spine had a little, it says open letter crime books with a little revolver on it. So I was like, okay, cool detective novel. But I mean, the back of it, Frode Brandegen, uh, 1970 to 2014, an unknown voice to most readers, made his debut in 1992 with the experimental 2000 plus page novel, Conglomerate Breath. It was never reviewed and soon forgotten. After that, he created a new genre, writing 15 micro novels about Red Handler, a protest oriented crime fiction project aimed at confronting the genre's weakness and often unnecessary length. As, a weapon, as his weapon, he developed a private investigator who is already at the scene or in the immediate vicinity when foul play takes place so that the perp can be caught red-handed and the case quickly solved, thus offering crime fiction to people who don't have the time to read long books or who simply hate to read but love crime. This book brings together all 15 micro-novels Brandegan wrote about Red Handler for the first time and is also equipped with a comprehensive amount of enthusiastic, explanatory, complimentary, and sometimes strangely digressive endnotes written in the pen of Brandegan's closest literary confidant in the final years, German professor annotator Bruno Eichner. So that's essentially what sold me on it. And I, mm. you know, uh, there was a bunch of books that I ended up putting back and, uh, but that one stayed with me and I'm glad I, I kept it. Did you understand like from the beginning that this was kind of like a metafictional like joke or were, were you partially sold on the kind of frame narrative narrative of it? For I was pretty well sold just based on the, the description on the back. But as I was uh, waiting for m the rest of my family to, finished looking for stuff and i was kind of flipping through it and started that's when i started seeing that it was this metafictional thing and i was like okay this could be really interesting so i sat down and read the first um the first micro novel itself and that's when i realized that you know this is more than just a a uh really uh what's the word i'm looking for obnoxiously kind of like pseudo intellectual kind of thing and more of a seriously you know pure hearted, you know, enjoyable and, and, and fun take on the detective novel genre. So that's, that's where I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna have a good time with this one. Nice. Yeah. And, and reading, like I'm, I'm reading right now, uh, the high window by Raymond Chandler. And so it's, you know, having re re uh, reread this one, uh, pretty recently, it's hard for me not to see these scenes in, in these old novels now and, and kind of think like, well, where's the, the goofy sort of stupid humor going to come from and it's, it's not there. So I need more of this in my life now. I, I, I'm going to try to find more uh, books like this. I'm, I'm imagining the author's other work is, is similar, if not in the same uh, detective genre. It's at least got the same balance of, of humor and smart writing. Well, it sounds like you need to revisit the Robert Altman long goodbye movie because... I really plenty, do. There's plenty of humor in that take on John Chandler's character. Yeah. No, so down. I guess we need to get down to brass tacks. Mm -hmm. Is are the criticisms of the crime novel genre accurate? Do you think that all crime fiction should be, you know, about fifteen pages max? <laughs> <laughs> I I certainly agree in the sense that it there is often, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I think most people who really enjoy the genre are aware of how easily solved certain things are and, and how the detective is certainly always sort of in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, those tropes are certainly true. And, and I think that's what, you know, makes it so funny to read something like this. But the I do enjoy the ride of getting from point A to point B in those novels. So uh, as much as I I have to agree with his assessment that oftentimes there is a, a an egregious amount of detail uh, dumped into a lot of those novels. It's part of the charm of those books at the same time, you know? Very true. And this, this is like kind of a tangent, I guess, but like I'm, I'm really hoping that there's going to be similar to the rise of like the post-Western 
like a, a, a post noir kind of genre of writing where the only things that I can really think of are, are like, you know, like mostly movies, you know, like Under the Silver yeah. Lake is very much like a post noir movie. Uh, like The Big Lebowski is like a post noir mm -hmm. kind of a thing. So is like Inherent Ice, whether you're reading the book or the movie. Um, yeah. But, but this, this idea that you can have like uh, books or movies that are critical of the genre because of how well worn the pathways of it are is something that I feel like has been exploited to great success in the Western sort of genre, but not so much in the detective genre. And I'd, I'd like to see more of that done for sure. And something like this, yeah. it takes like the humorous aspect of like poking fun at it. But I do wonder what a, what a more serious attempt at doing something like that could be. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And it is a shame that it seems to really, that, that idea or that style seems to really be relegated to film. Yeah. Um. And uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is another one that comes to mind. Yeah. Too, yeah, with that. yeah. that was a really fun movie. <laughs> it's it's who it, call it's, you math? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. It, it's there's a lot in that genre that I think is is really worthwhile, and it's it's a real shame that it kind of died the death that it died mm -hmm. because at the time it was happening, you know, you had the the books, you had the film adaptations. The radio presentations of a lot of those stories were really cool too. They would pull in a lot of the old actors, and you know they had Bogart come in a few times and play uh, Philip Marlowe, or they would have, um, why can't I think of his name? The other Sam Spade, uh, Sam Spade, but the other actor who played Marlowe more famously. Um, God, I can I can see him. I can't think of his name right now. He was in Out of the Pat Mitchum, Robert Mitchum. Oh sure, they had him come on a few times too, and the, yeah, those radio broadcasts were really cool, but that that style just sort of died a really sad death and really, like you said, kind of only maintained itself in film and the, mm -hmm. the detective novel itself outside of your, your James L. Roy's and your um, uh, Elmore Leonard's doesn't really exist in, in a wide selection like it used to anymore. So it's, it's a genre that I would love to see come back uh, and, and really, you know, uh, well, and I think, Jeff Vandermeer did a a really interesting detective novel, uh, Finch, that was fun. It wasn't yeah, it wasn't humorous by any means, aside from a few you know Vandermeer era or Vandermeer esque uh, uh -huh. humorous parts of it. But it's you know that's the closest we've had outside of film, really, which is a shame. So anyone out there who writes, you know, let's let's bring this genre back. I've had a couple of detective novel ideas bouncing around in my head that I've tried to get going but i just can't i worry too much about doing the genre wrong i feel uh, like it's too easy to do it very wrong um so i'm I'm hoping that maybe someone can crack that nut and and get that genre kickstarted again yeah especially because you know like like the post-western genre is certainly like a critique of those tropes right like talking about like the yeah. inherent like fallacy of like the western expansion and like viewing you know the land and its resources is exploitable, especially in a day and age in which, like, criticism of the police in a completely justified manner is yeah. at a, a a degree of cultural awareness that I don't think it ever has had before. You would think that you'd have an opportunity to do something like that um, with yeah. with you know some writing. Well, and even you know authors like Pinchon play with the genre a little yeah. bit, but it it's never been his main focus. And I mean. Correct. If he wrote a, a, a hard-boiled noir detective novel, Jesus, I would be all over it. <laughs> but we great. get, you know, I mean, Doc Sportello is a, you know, he's a modernized version of that, but Inherent Vice in itself is is a lot more than just a detective novel. Bleeding Edge, you know, Maxine, kind of a, a female inversion of the detective, but again, that is not a full detective story. And then uh, in the, coming up and against the day, we have the Lou Bass Night stuff, which is... Uh, probably my favorite some of my favorite stuff in that book but it is just passages of it and it's you know again it is way more than just a detective story so um it's yeah it, it's i feel like there's a lot of authors out there that have the capability to write a good detective story and have played with the genre in in different ways but have not you know gone you know full barrel and, and really gone for it mm-hmm well, I guess that begs the question then, Cody, if you were to write a detective novel, what would it, what would it be about? Like, what's the story you have kicking around in your head? So the most recent one that I, I really started on is I, I've kind of always wanted a, 
a blend of fantasy and a detective story Mm -hmm. because those are two of my favorite genres and two that i really grew up especially in like middle school high school that was a lot of what i was reading uh was those two genres and so the the last one i've been playing around with is a a sort of blend of the two of a very very low fantasy but using the the sort of grimy hard-boiled detective um story and right now it's it is very early in the gestation process i'm really just kind of trying to create characters and and figure out how i want to present it uh, it was something it's it's a story idea that i i was kind of initially starting to map out when i was running a D campaign but that unfortunately fell apart just because people have adult lives and we couldn't get together all the time to play uh so i started picking pieces out of that and and using that where basically it was the the story was centered around a a murder and the dissolution of of magic in the world like something had happened that made that go away that's tied to the murder that takes place and so the detective has to kind of go put the pieces together and figure out you know what happened and who's behind all of it but i haven't gotten beyond setting a lot of that up and trying to figure out where it's going to go neat i mean i would read that i also toyed with the idea of of redoing or taking the bones of of lord of the rings and trying to make that into a detective story (laughs) which i've managed to get the characters like i mapped out the fellowship and how they would all tie to the detective um and i flipped sam and frodo into where sam is the detective and frodo was essentially the femme fatale (laughs) but i haven't been able to figure out like how i want to move that story wise so that's just an idea that's sitting in a notebook waiting for me to kind of figure out how to make that happen and not pull it out to a thousand plus pages but really distill it down to a you know how can i make the journey from essentially from the shire to mordor really take place in like a city and and kind of minimize a lot of that so that's that's kind of the two ideas that i've really been kicking around both of those sound like they'd be a lot of fun my my brain is now stuck in a loop of trying to figure out how to how to put Gollum in a city escape (laughs) yeah (laughs) i i think the last time i i revisited that idea it was to have him lurking in the sewers and Uh, i could i don't know what he would be doing down there or just like a real like rorschach end is near guy who wanders around oh yeah that would be good about like you know the end of the world or whatever so yeah, that's that's my pitch on the Red Handler. Johan Harstead, if you're listening, I expect royalties uh, from every copy sold from whenever this comes out going forward. So. Going for in perpetuity. You're looking for perpetuity. Yeah. You're, you're I looking figure for royalties. I, I figure I'm due, you know. But yeah, it's, it's so it's published by Open Letter uh, at the University of Rochester. Um, I'll put a link to their website in the show notes for this one. And um, yeah, if you like crime fiction, if you like detective fiction, um, this is totally worth your time, and uh, I think it'll make for a fun read for anyone who picks it up. Neat. And it does look like it's on sale on Amazon. If you're someone oh, who perfect. uses Amazon, it's $10 right now. Oh, nice. That's cheaper than the cover price. All that being said, thank you so much for listening, and uh, we will see you all next time with the next bonus episode.